John Gill's Exposition of the Entire Bible, verse by verse. 1 John, chapter 2. Introduction. In this chapter, the Apostle confirms the saint under a sense of sin, urges them to in observations of the commandments of God in imitation of Christ, particularly to the new commandments of brotherly love, and gives his reason for it. Dehorts them from the love of the world and the things of it, cautions them against false teachers and antichrist, and exhorts them to abide in Christ and preserve in the faith of him. He first declares that the end of his writing was to prevent their sinning. But supposing any should fall into sin through infirmity, he comforts them with the consideration of the advocacy of Christ and of his being the propitiation for the sins both of the Jews and Gentiles. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. And whereas some persons might boast of their knowledge of Christ and neglect his commands, he observes that the keeping of them is the best evidence of true knowledge and of the sincerity of their love to God and of their being in Christ, and that such who show no regard to them are liars, and the truth is not in them. And such that profess to be in Christ and abide in him ought to walk as they have him for an example. First John chapter 2, verse 3. And instances in a peculiar commandment to love one another, which on different accounts is called an old and new commandment, and which have been verified both in Christ and his people, for which a reason is given in the latter, the darkness being past, and the true light shining. 1 John 2, 7. Upon which some proposals are founded, as that he that professes to be in the light and hates his brother is in darkness even to this very moment, and that he that loves his brother is evidently in the light, nor will he easily give or take offense, and that he that hates his brother is not only in darkness, but walks in it, being blinded by it, and so knows not whether he is going. First John chapter 2, verse 9. In this commandment of love, the apostle writes to the saints as distinguished into the several classes of fathers, young men, and children, and urges it on them from the consideration of the blessings of grace peculiar to them as ancient knowledge to fathers, strength, and victory to young men. Knowledge of the Father and remission of sins to children, 1 John 2.12. And then he dissuades from the love of worldly things, seeing the love of them is not consistent for the love of God, and seeing the things that are in it are vain and sinful, and are not of God, but of the world. And since the world and its lust passed away, when he that does the will of God abides forever, 1 John 2.15, he next observes unto them that they, there were many antichrists in the world, which was an evidence of his being the last time, and these he describes as schematics and apostates from the Christian churches, 1 John 2.18. But as for the saints he writes to, they were of another character. They were truly Christians having an anointing from the Holy One, by which they knew all things. Nor did the Apostle write to them as ignorant, but as knowing persons, and able to distinguish between truth, truth and error. 1 John 2.20 And then he goes on with his description of anti-Christian liars, showing that they, they were such who denied Jesus to be the Messiah, and the relation that is between the Father and the Son. 1 John 2.22 and closes the chapter with an exhortation to perseverance in the doctrine of Christ, since it was what they had heard from the beginning, and since by so doing they would continue in the Father and in the Son, and besides had the promise of eternal life. 1 John 2.24 And indeed, this was the main thing in view in writing to them concerning seducers, to preserve them from them, though indeed this was in a great measure Needless, since the anointing they had received abode in them and taught them all things, and according as they regarded its teaching, they would abide in Christ, 1 John 2.26, to which he exhorts them from the consideration of that boldness and confidence it would give them at his appearance, who they must know is righteous, and so that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him, 
1 John 2, 28. John Gill's exposition of the entire Bible, verse by verse. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, the apostle may address the saints under this character and account of their regeneration of the Spirit and the grace of God, in which they were as newborn babes, and on account of his being the instrument of their conversion, and so was their spiritual father, and therefore caused them his own children, and he might the rather use such a way of speaking because of his advanced age, being now in his old age, and John the Elder in age as well as in office, as well as to show his parental affection for them and care for them, and that what he wrote or should write was not from any disrespect, but from pure love to them, and it might serve to put them in mind of their weakness and faith and knowledge and spiritual strength, that they might not entertain high notions of themselves as if they were perfect and without infirmities. And it is easy to observe that this is one of Christ's expressions. John 13, verse 33. From whose lips the apostle took it, whose words and phrases he greatly delighted in, as he seems to do in this by his frequent use of it. See 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. These things write unto you concerning the purity and holiness of God, who is light itself, concerning the fellowship with him, with no one that lives in sin can have, concerning pardon and cleansing from sin by the blood of Christ, and concerning sin being in them, and they not without it. The Gothic version reads, We write, as in 1 John chapter 1, verse 4, that you sin not, not that he thought they could be entirely without it, either without the being of it or the commission of it in thought, word, or deed. For this would be to suppose that which is contrary to his own words in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. But he suggests that the end of his writing of on these subjects was that he might not live in sin and indulge himself themselves in a victorious course of living, give up themselves to it and walk in it, and work it with all greediness, and nothing could be more suitably adapted to such an end than the consideration of the holiness of God, who caused by his grace and of the necessity of light and grace and holiness in men to communion with him and of the parting grace of God and cleansing blood of Christ, which, when savingly applied, sets men against sin and makes them zealous of good works, and of the indwelling of sin in the saints, which puts them upon their guard against it. And if any man sin, as every man does, even everyone that is in the light and walks in it in his fellowship with God, everyone that believes in Christ and is justified through his righteousness and pardon by his blood, every one of the little children, for the apostle is not speaking to mankind in general who sin, for Christ is not an advocate for all that sin, but to these in particular, hence the Arabic version renders it, if any of you sin. And this, with the following, he says, not to encourage in sin, but to comfort under a sense of it. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Christ is an advocate, not for just and righteous persons, for as he came not to call these to repentancy, nor to die for them, so such have no need of an advocate, nor is he one of them, but as he came to call sinners, and to save them, and died for them, the just for the unjust. So he is an advocate, and makes intercession for transgressors, and not for all men, though they have all sinned, not for the world, and those so called in distinction from the persons given by the Father. For these he prays not, but for all the elect, and whatsoever charges are brought against them, he answers to them, and for them, and for all that believe in him, be they weak or strong, even for the apostles as well as others, for they were not without sin, were men of like passions as others, and carried about with them a body of sin, and had their daily infirmities, and so needed an advocate as others. And hence John says, We have an advocate, etc. But then, Christ is not an advocate for sin, though he, for sinners. He does not vindicate the commission of sin, or plead for the performance of it. He is no patron of iniquity, nor does he deny that his clients have sin or affirm that their actions are not sins. He allows in his courts all their sins with all their 
uh, aggravated circumstances, nor does he go about to excuse or extenuate them. But he is an advocate for the non-imputation of them and for the application of pardon to them. He pleads in their favor that these sins have been laid upon him and he has bore them, that his blood has been shed for the remission of sin and that he has made full satisfaction for them. And therefore, in justice, they ought not to be laid to the charge, but that the forgiveness of them should be applied upon them for the relief and comfort of their burden and distressed consciences. And for this, he is an advocate for his poor sinning people with the Father, who being the first person and the Son, the Advocate, and the Spirit sustaining a like character is only mentioned. And he being God against whom sin is committed and to whom satisfaction is made, and the rather as he is the Father of Christ and of those for whom he is an advocate, seeing it may be concluded that his pleadings will be with success since he is not only related to him and has an interest in him himself, but the persons also whose patron he is are related to him and have a share in his parental affection and care. Moreover, this phrase, as it expresses the distinct personality of Christ from the Father, so his being with him in heaven, at his right hand and nearness to him, where he discharges this office of his, partly by appearing in person for his people in the presence of God, and partly by carrying in and presenting their confessions of sins and their prayers for the fresh discoveries and applications of pardoning grace, which he offers up to his Father with the sweet incense of his mediation, and chiefly by pleading the virtue of his blood, righteousness, and sacrifice, which are carried within the veil, and are always in sight, and call aloud for peace and pardon, as also by answering and removing the charges and accusations of the court adversary, the accuser of the brethren, the devil, as well as the declaration of his will, demanding his point of justice, in consideration of his sufferings and death, that such and such blessings be bestowed upon his people, as pardon, righteousness, grace, and supplies of grace, and at last glory, and by applying these benefits to the souls as a comforter, which the word here used also signifies and is so rendered. John chapter 14, verse 16, and by the Arabic version here, now the saints have but one advocate, and that is enough for them. The apostle does not say we have advocates, but an advocate. Not angels nor saints departed, but Jesus Christ only, who is the one mediated between God and man. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. And he has a continual one. He ever lives to make an accession. His blood is always speaking, and he always pleading. And therefore it is said, We have, now we have had, or we shall have an advocate, or he is a prevalent one. He is always heard. He thoroughly pleads the cause he undertakes, and ever carries it, which is owing to the dignity of his person his interest with his father and the virtue and value of his sacrifice, and he every way fit for such a work, for he is righteous, not only in his nature, both divine and human, but in his office as mediator, which he faithfully and righteously performs. He is a very proper person to plead for guilty persons, which he could not do if he himself was guilty. But he is so holy and righteous that nothing can be objected to, to him by God, and it need not be doubted by men that he will act a faithful part to them and righteously serve them in their cause. And it is moreover his righteousness, which he has wrought out and is imputed to them, that carries the cause for them, and therefore this character of Christ fitly added, as is also the following. The Jews have adopted the word in the text into their language, but have applied it to a, a different purpose, to alms, deeds, repentance, and good works. Much more agreeably, Philo the Jew speaks of the son of the perfect virtue as an advocate for the forgiveness of sins and for a supply of everlasting things. John Gill, 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. Scripture, quote, And he is the propitiation for our sins, unquote, for the sins of us, who now believe in our Jews. Scripture, quote, And not for ours only, unquote, 
but for the sins of the Old Testament saints and of those who shall afterwards believe in Christ and of the Gentiles also, signified in the next clause. Scripture, quote, but also for the sins of the whole world, unquote. The Syriac version renders it not for us only, but also for the whole world. That is, not for the Jews only, for John was a Jew, and so were those he wrote unto, but for the Gentiles also. Nothing is more common in Jewish writing than to call the Gentiles the world, and the whole world, the nations of the world. See on John chapter 12, verse 19. And the word world is so used in Scripture. See John 3.16. And stands opposed to a notion, the Jews have the Gentiles, that there is no propitiation for them. And it is easy to observe that when this phrase is not used of the Gentiles, it is to be understood in a limited and restrained sense, as when they say, it happened to a certain high priest, then when he went out of the sanctuary, the whole world went after him, which could only design the people in the temple. But in elsewhere it is said, the whole world has left the Mishnah and gone after the Gemara, that's G-E-M-A-R-A, which at most can only intend the Jews and indeed only a majority of their doctors who were conversant with these writings and in another place, the whole world fell on their faces. But wrath, R-A-F, did not fall on his face. Where it means no more than the congregation, once more it is said, when the whole world stood up before him, that is, the people in the synagogue to which may be added, when a great man makes a mourning, the whole world comes to honor him. An example, a great number of persons attend the funeral pomp, and so these phrases, the whole world, is not divided or does not dissent. The whole world are of opinion, are frequently met with in the Talmud, by which an agreement among the rabbins in certain points is designed. Yea, the inhabitants of a city, where a synagogue was, and at most only the Jews, and so this phrase, all the world, or the whole world, and scriptures, unless when it signifies the whole universe or the habitable earth is always used in a limited sense, either for the Roman emperor or the churches of Christ in the world or believers or the present inhabitants of the world or a part of them only. See Luke chapter 2 verse 1. And so it is in this epistle. 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, where the whole world lying in wickedness is manifestly distinguished from the saints who are of God and belong not to the world and therefore cannot be understood of all the inhabitants in the world. And the like distinction is in this text itself, for the sins of the whole world are opposed to our sins. The sins of the apostle and others to whom he joins himself, who therefore belonged not to, nor were a part of the whole world, for whose sins Christ is a propitiation, as for theirs, so that this passage cannot furnish out any argument for universal redemption. For besides these things, it may be further observed that for whose sins Christ is a propitiation, their sins are atoned for and pardoned, and their persons justified from all sin, and so shall certainly be glorified, which is not true of the whole world, and every man and woman in it. Moreover, Christ is a propitiation through faith in his blood. The benefit of his propitiatory sacrifice is only received and enjoyed through faith, so that in the event it appears that Christ is a propitiation only for believers, a character which does not agree with all mankind. Add to this, that for whom Christ is a propitiation, he is also an advocate. First John chapter 2, verse 1. 
but he is not an advocate for every individual person in the world. Yea, there is a world he will not pray for. John 17, verse 9. The consequently is not a propitiation for them. Once more, the design of the apostle in these words is to comfort his little children with the advocacy and propitiatory sacrifice of Christ, who might fall into sin through weakness and advertisements. But with comfort would it yield to a distressed mind to be told that Christ was a propitiation not only for the sins of the apostles and other saints, but for the sins of every individual in the world, even of these that are in hell? Would it not be natural for persons in such circumstances to argue rather against than for themselves and conclude that seeing persons might be damned notwithstanding the propitiation sacrifice of Christ, that this might and would be their case? In what sense Christ is a propitiation? See Gil on Romans 3.25. The Jews have no notion of the Messiah as a propitiation or atonement. Sometimes they say, repentancy atones for all sin. Sometimes the death of the righteous. Sometimes incense. Sometimes the priest's garments. Sometimes it is a duty of atonement. And indeed they are in the utmost puzzle about atonement. And they can even confess in their prayers that they have now neither altar nor priest to atone for them. See John on 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. John Gill, 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. Scripture, quote, In hereby do we know that we know him, unquote. Either the Father with whom Christ is an advocate, not as the God of nature, but by the light of it, nor as the lawgiver and judge of the whole earth, and by the law of Moses, but as the God of all grace, as a God pardoning iniquity, transgression, and sin, as the Father of Christ, and as in Him by the gospel, this not in a mere notion and speculative way, but with love and affection, not with fear and trembling, as devils know Him, nor in theory, as formal professors and hypocrites, but with a knowledge joined with hearty love of Him, and cheerful obediency to him, or else Christ, the advocate and propitiation for sin, and him also, not with a mere notion, knowledge of his person and offices, which carnal men and devils themselves have of him, but with that which is spiritual, special, and saving, being from the Spirit and grace of God, and regards Christ as a Savior, as a propitiation sacrifice for sin, and an advocate with God the Father, and by which he is approved as such, to the rejection of all other saviors, sacrifices, and advocacies, and is trusted, confided, and believed in as such an affectionately loved, that above all others, in sincerity and truth, and is readily obeyed in his word and ordinances. For where there is true knowledge of Christ, there is faith in him, and where there is faith in him, there is love to him, for faith works by love, and where there is love to him, there will be an observancy of his commands, and this is here made the evidence of the true knowledge of him, for it follows, scripture, quote, if we keep his commandments, unquote, not the commandments of men, for the keeping of them arises from the ignorance of God, and is a proof of it, nor the commandments of the ceremonial law, which are abolished, particularly circumcision, which is opposed to the keeping of the commandments of God. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 19. But either those of the moral law, and which are more particularly the commandments of God the Father, the observancy of which, though it cannot be with perfection, yet being in love and from love to God and with a view to His glory, it is evident of the true knowledge of Him and of His will, or else those commandments, which are more especially the commandments of Christ Jesus, such as the ordinances of the baptism and the Lord's Supper, which are peculiar to the gospel dispensation, and which being kept as they were delivered by Christ, and in his name and strength, and to his glory, without depending on them for life and salvation, is an argument and proof of the right knowledge of him, and particularly his new commandment of loving one another, may be chiefly designed in being what the apostle has greatly in view throughout this epistle. 
Now let it be observed that keeping of the commands of God or Christ is not the knowledge of either of them itself, for much may be done in an external way, yet neither Christ nor God be spiritually and satanly known. Nor is it the cause of such knowledge, for that is owing to the Spirit and the grace of God, but it is an effect or consequent of spiritual knowledge, and so an evidence of it. Hereby is not the knowledge itself, but the knowledge of that knowledge that is, that is true and genuine. John Gill, 1 John chapter 2, verse 4. Scripture, quote, He that saith, I know him, unquote. God or Christ, as the Gnostics did, who pretended to great, even perfect knowledge of divine things. Scripture, quote, And keepeth not his commandments, unquote, which the above persons had no regard to, and as many who professed great light knowledge in our days show no concern for. Scripture, quote, Is a liar, unquote. He contradicts what he says and gives the lie to it, for though in words he professes to know God, in works he denies him, and which betrays his ignorance of him. Scripture, quote, And the truth is not in him, unquote. There is no true knowledge of God and Christ in him, nor is the truth of the gospel in his heart. However, it may be in his head, nor is the truth of grace in him, for each of these lead persons to obediency. The Ethiopic version renders it, the truth of God is not with him. See Gill on 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. 1 John chapter 2, verse 5. Scripture, quote, But whoso keepeth his word, unquote, either the word of the gospel and the truths of it, who receives it in love, cordially embraces and retains it, and will by no means part with it, but holds it fast and stands fast in it, or the precepts and ordinances of the word, who loves these and esteems them above fine gold and concerning all things to be right and observes them as they should be. Scripture, quote, In him verily is the love of God perfected, unquote. Not the love wherewith God loves him, for this is perfect in himself and admits of no degrees and cannot be more or less in his heart and is entirely independent of the obediency of men or any works of theirs, it is true indeed the manifestations of this love to the saints are imperfect and may be more and greater and greater manifestations of love are promised to such that love Christ and keep his commandments. John chapter 14 verse 21. But here it is to be understood not actively but passively of the love wherewith God is loved by his people and intends not the absolute perfection of it in them in whom it often waxes cold and is left, or the fever of it abated, but the sincerity and reality of it. For by keeping the word of God, both his truths and his ordinances, it is clearly seen that their love to him is about dissimulation, and is not in tongue only, but in deed and in truth. Now, it is not the keeping of the word of God that causes this love or makes it perfect or sincere, for it is a fruit of the Spirit and is owing to the grace of God. But love, on the other hand, is the cause of keeping of the word, and the latter being a consequent and an effect of the former, it is the evidence of it, of the truth and the sincerity of it. Scripture, quote, Hereby know we that we are in him, unquote, in Christ, not merely nominally or by profession, as all that name the name of Christ and are in a gospel church state may be said to be, but really, first, secretly, through the love of Christ, the election of God, the covenant of grace, and then openly in, in conversion and effectual calling, through believing in Christ, when the saints appear to be in him as branches in the vine, and which is known by their fruits as here, by keeping the word, and doing the commandments of Christ, which do not put a man into Christ, but only show that he is there. For a man's being in Christ is owing to the grace of God. This is the first thing done in grace. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. John Gill. 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. Scripture, quote, He that saith he abideth in him, unquote, 
as all do that are in him, once in Christ and always in Christ, they are set as a seal on his arm and heart, which can never be removed. They are in his arms and can never be plucked from thence, and are members of him and can never be disunioned from him, or dwelleth in him, as in John chapter 6, verse 56. That is, by faith, who under a sense of sin and danger have fled to Christ, as to a strong tower and place of defense, where they dwell safely, peaceably, pleasantly, and comfortably, enjoying whatever is necessary for them. The Syriac and Ethiopic versions read, He that saith, I am in him, loved by him, chosen in him, united to him, a member of his and his, have communion with him. Scripture quote, Ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. Unquote. As Christ walked, lived, and acted, so ought he, that is, to imitate him and follow him, as he has him for an example, not in his miraculous works in raising the dead, healing the sick, and walking upon the waters, etc., which are wrought as proofs of his deity and of his messiahship, and not intended for imitation, nor in his miniatural performances as in his propitiation, sacrifice, and advocacy, but in the exercise of grace and duties of religion as a man and in a perfect way, and may chiefly regard walking in love as he walked. See Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. And is what is in the following verses insisted on, namely, the new commandments of love to the brethren, which should be to all as he was, and like his constant and lasting and, when the case requires, should be shown by laying down life for them, that as is not a note of equality, but of likeness. For it cannot be thought that saints should walk in the decree of perfection, in humility, patience, love, and the exercise of every other grace, and in the discharge of duty as Christ did, only that they should copy after him and make his obedience in life the rule of theirs. John Gill, 1 John chapter 2, verse 7, Scripture, quote, Brethren, I write no new commandments unto you, unquote. Some understand this of faith, which this apostle calls a commandment. 1 John chapter 3, verse 23. But it rather intends the commandments of love, especially to the brethren, of which the apostle says, the same things as here in the second epistle, 1 John 2, verse 5. And this sense agrees both with what goes before and follows after and is a considerable branch of the commandment of Christ to be kept and of walking as he walked. And the word brother in prefix to this account may direct to and strengthen by sense through the Vulgate Latin, Syriac versions read, Beloved. And so the Alexandrian copy and others and this commandment is said to be not a new one. Scripture, quote, But an old commandment which ye had from the beginning, unquote, it being in its original a part of the eternal law of truth, found upon the unalterable nature and eternal will of God, who is love itself and requires it in all his creatures, being what was written on Adam's heart, state of innocence, and a branch of divine image stamped upon him, and is what was delivered in the law of Moses for love to God and men in the sum and substance of that, and was taught by Christ and his apostles from the beginning of the gospel dispensation, and what was the saints had been acquainted with, and influentially instructed in their first conversation, being taught of God in regeneration to love one another, so that this was no novel doctrine, no upstart notion, no new law, but the greatest and the most venerable antiquity, and therefore to be regarded in the most respectful manner. Scripture, quote, The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning, unquote. Or this ancient law of love is contained in and enforced by that word or doctrine that was delivered from the beginning of time, in which these saints have had and heard concerning the seed of the woman's bruising the serpent's head, which includes the work of redemption and salvation by Christ, atonement by his sacrifices, forgiveness of sins through his blood, and justification by his righteousness. 
Then, which nothing can more powerfully engage to love God and Christ and one another, and which is also strongly encouraged by the word of God and the gospel of Christ, which they had heard and had a spiritual and saving knowledge of, from the time they were effectually called by the grace of God, the phrase, from the beginning, is left out of the Alexandrian copy and others, but in the Vulgate Latin, Syriac, and Ecopic version, it is, is omitted in both clauses of the text in the latter. John Gill, 1 John chapter 2, verse 8. Scripture, quote, Again, a new commandment I write unto you, unquote, which is the same from the former, considered in a different respects, the commandment of brotherly love and a new one, that is, is an excellent one, as a new name and an excellent name, and a new song and an excellent one, it is renewed by Christ under the gospel dispensation. It is newly explained by him and purged from the false glosses of the scribes and Pharisees. See Matthew chapter 5 verse 43. And enforced by him with a new commandment and by a new example of his own, even his own love to his people and which is observed by them in a new manner. They being made new creatures and this law being a new written in their hearts under the renewing work of the spirit of God a branch of the new covenant of grace. See John chapter 13, verse 34. The Jews expect a new law to be given them by the bands of the Messiah, and a new one he has given, even the new commandments of love, which is fulfilling of the law. Scripture, quote, Which things is true in him and in you, unquote. The Alexandrian copy reads, In us, the sense is either, It is true in itself, as the phrase will bear to be rendered, and it is verified in you or in us to be a new commandment. Or, it is true in Christ, it is yea and amen in him. It has its full completion in him, who is the fulfilling end of the law, as well as it has been faithfully delivered, truly explained, and warmly and affectionately recommended, and urged by him, and he is the great pattern and exemplifier of it, and the love which... This new commandment requires is really and truly in the saints implanted in them and regeneration is the fruit of the Spirit and which faith works by and will always continue in them and should be in its actings like Christ, true, sincere, cordial, affectionate, constant, and universal. And some think the word, let it be, is wanting in the last clause and may be read, which thing is true in him and is, or let it be in you. That is, a love to the brethren is true and sincere in Christ, so it is and should be in you. It should be without dissimulation, and so it was, as the reason following shows. Scripture, quote, because the darkness is past, unquote, or is passing, meaning either darkness of the ceremonial law, which lay in dark types and shadows and in cloudy sacrifices and mystical representations of things, and was a shadow of good things to come, and its shadow now fleeing away apace, in fact, as well as in right, and so the Alexandrian copy reads, because the shadow is passing away. And the night of the Jewish darkness was far spent, and the gospel day was not only broken, but it was, or near noonday was brought the light of faith and the heat of love with it, or else the darkness of sin and ignorance by state of nature and of the kingdom of Satan, in which the people of God are before conversion, which then passes away gradually, little by little, for it is not removed at once or wholly gone. For though the saints are at once removed out of a state of darkness and from a kingdom of darkness and the power of it, yet they are not wholly free from the darkness of sin and ignorance see. They still see that through a glass darkly, and the words are better rendered, the darkness passes or is passing away, and not is passed or has passed away, for as yet it is not entirely gone. Scripture, quote, And the true light now shineth, unquote. Either the gospel, which is the light, and a true and substantial one, in distinction with the dim light of nature, or the shadowy law of Moses, and which now under the present dispensation shines out in a most glorious manner, as the sun in its full strength, and so the copic version renders it, the light of truth, the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, or Jesus Christ, who is so called, John chapter 1, verse 9, in distinction with typical lights, as in the Urim, 
of the high priest's breastplate, the candlestick in the tabernacle in the temple, the pillar of fire by night, which guided the Israelites through the wilderness and in opposition to all false lights, to the scribes and Pharisees, to false Christ and false prophets, which are so many. For Christ is the Son of Righteousness, which is risen out in our horizon, the true light which shines out in the most illuminous manner, or the light of grace is here intended, the light which the Spirit of God illuminates with in conversion, in which a man sees sin in its true color and has a spiritual and saving sight of Christ, of pardon, peace, life, righteousness, and salvation by him, which is no other than the light of faith by which an enlightened person sees the sun, looks to him, and has an evidence of an unseen glories of another world. Now this is the true light. Things are seen by the believer in the right light, both of his own sins and the person, the blood, and righteousness of Christ. This is a shining one which cannot be but observed by himself and shines more and more to the perfect day. And now shines as it did before in a state of nature and continues to shine and ever will this light will never be put out, and is the cause of brotherly love, being truly in the saints, and of the continuity of it. Before this light shines, men live in malice, but when it comes and shines as they walk in the light, they walk in love. John Gill, 1 John chapter 2, verse 9. Scripture, quote, He that saith he is in the light, unquote, is in Christ the light, or has the true knowledge of the light of the gospel, or is illuminated by the Spirit of God, for persons may profess to be enlightened ones and not be so. Wherefore the apostle does not say, He that is in the light, but he that says he is. Scripture quote. And hateth his brother. Unquote. Who is so either by creation, as all men are brethren, having one father that has made them and brought them up, or by regeneration, being born of God the Father, and in the same family and household of faith, and so regard such who are in a spiritual relation, whom to hate internally or not to love is inconsistent with being in the light or having faith, which is always naturally and necessarily accompanied with the heat of love. For as light and heat, so faith and love go together. Wherefore, let a man's profession of light be what it will, if love to his brother is wanting, he, scripture, quote, is in darkness even until now, unquote. He is in a state of nature and unregenerous, which is a state of darkness and ignorancy. He is under the power of darkness and in the kingdom of Satan, who is the ruler of the darkness of this world. He ever was so from his birth. He never was called nor delivered out of it, but is still in it to this moment. And so remains. This seems to be very much leveled against the Jews, who make hatred of the brother, in some cases lawful. For they say, if one man observes sin in another, and reproves him for it, and he does not receive his reproof, it is lawful to hate him. See Gill in Matthew 5.43. John Gill, 1 John chapter 2, verse 10, Scripture, quote, He that loveth his brother, unquote, as such, and because he is his brother in Christ, and that cordially and sincerely, without hypocrisy and dissimulation, and by love serves him, both in things temporal and spiritual, and so observes the new and yet old commandment. Scripture, quote, abideth in the light, unquote. It is a plain case that such a man is in the light of grace and continues in it, for though it is not his love to the brethren which is the cause of his light, of his being and continuing in it, for that is owing to the spirit of light and knowledge, but on the contrary, light is the cause of his love. Yet it is an evidence of it, that by which it is known, as the cause is known by the effect. See John chapter 3, verse 14. Scripture, quote, And there is none occasion of stumbling in him, unquote, or there is no scandal or offense in him. He gives no offense to his brother, or at least as much as in him lies. He takes care that he gives none. He avoids as much as he can, putting a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. By use of things indifferent or by any other action, nor will he easily take offense at what is said or done unto him. For charity or love is not easily provoked. It suffers long 
and bears all things. See 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Nor does he so much and so frequently transgress the laws of God, and particularly those which regard his neighbor or his brother or so easily fall into the snares of Satan. Because he is in the light and walks in the light and sees his way and what lies in his way and so shuns and avoids occasion of stumbling and falling. There is not in him that wrath and malice and envy which lead on to the commission of other sins. For love works no ill, but fulfills the law, and will not suffer him to commit adultery, to kill, to steal, or bear false witness against his neighbor, friend, and brother. See Romans 13, verse 9. And such a one enjoys great peace, tranquility, and happiness. He has much comfort in himself and pleasure in the saints and delight in their company. He walks inoffensively and in a harmless manner, without hurting himself or any other. Psalms 119, verse 165. John Gill, 1 John chapter 2, verse 11, quote, But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, unquote, as is before expressed in 1 John chapter 2, verse 9, to which is added, quote, And walketh in darkness, unquote, and he goes on in it and takes delight in it, as dangerous and uncomfortable as it is. Scripture, quote, And knoweth not whether he goeth, unquote, he cannot discern between good and evil, but puts darkness for light and light for darkness, and sees not what is before him, nor what stumbling blocks lie in the way. He is not aware of the snares, pits, and traps. He is in danger of falling into, nor does he know and consider what these paths of darkness, of sin, of ignorancy, and fidelity leads unto, even unto, utter darkness. Where is weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth? And the reason is, Scripture quote, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes, unquote. Either Satan, the God of this world, who blinds the minds of them that believe not, and who is darkness itself, and the cause of darkness in himself and in others, and one of whose names this was with the Jews. See Gil on Luke chapter 22, verse 53 or that natural darkness which sin has brought upon the understanding and has blinded the eyes of it, called the blindness of the heart. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 18 So that a man under the power of it is ignorant of himself and knows not that he is blind and miserable, is a stranger to the way of peace and life by Christ and knows not what he is about and where he is or whether he is going and what his end will be. John Gill, First chap, John chapter 2, verse 12. Scripture, quote, I write unto you little children, unquote, by whom the apostle means in every common all the saints he writes to, whom he afterwards distributes into fathers, young men, and little children. For the same word is used here as in First John chapter 2, verse 1, and a different one from that which is rendered little children in First John 2, Verse 13, And besides, following the blessing of pardon of sin is common to all the children of God of different ages. Now what the Apostle says he writes unto them intends not the epistle in general, but the new commandment of love in particular, in which he urges and enforces on them all for this reason. Scripture, quote, Because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake, unquote. These little children have been sinners by nature and patience and were not now without sin, but they shared in the blessing of the forgiveness of it, which arises from the abundant mercy and rich grace of God and proceeds on the blood and sacrifice of Christ, and therefore is said to be for his name's sake, not for the sake of any merits of, in men and ser any service or works of theirs, but for the sake of Christ, his blood, sacrifice and satisfaction, and it reaches to all sins, original and actual, secret and open, past, present, and to come, and here intends the application of it by the Spirit of God and the reception of it by faith, in which, as it is a reason, an argument, encouraging love to God, who freely and fully forgives, and to Christ whose blood was shed for the remission of sin, so to their brethren and fellow Christians, who are equally sharers in the same blessing, 
when they should love because they are loved of God in Christ and whom they should forgive because God, for Christ's sake, has to forgive in them. It may be they may be called here little children with a view of their interest in this blessing of grace. So the Jews say that Saul was called the son of one year in his reign, for Samuel 13, 1, because all his iniquities were forgiven him as a sucking child of a year old. John Gill, 1 John chapter 2, verse 13, Scripture, quote, I write unto you fathers, unquote, not merely in age, though they may, might be men in years, who are here intended, or only with respect to their long standing in the church, which might be the case, though persons may be in years and of a long standing in the church, and yet be children in knowledge and experience. But here it designs such who, in comparison of others, were perfect and were spiritual and judged all things, had a well-informed and established judgment in divine things, and were, in understanding, men fathers and not babes in Christ so the Jews used to call their men of wisdom and knowledge and understanding about fathers. Hence there is a whole treatise in the Mishnah called Perket Abat which obtains the Apoh that's A-P-O-P-H-T-H-E-G-M-S wise sayings and sentences of their fathers or wise men. Now the Apostle writes the new commandment of love and urges it on these for this reason. Scripture, quote, Because ye have known him, that is, from the beginning, unquote. Either God the Father who is from everlasting to everlasting, the Ancient of Days, the Eternal, I Am, whom to know is life eternal and whose everlasting love to them, whose covenant of grace with his Son for them before the world was, and the ancient transactions, and settlements of his grace on their account, they were acquainted with, or Jesus Christ, the Lagos, or Word, which was from the beginning, who existed from all eternity, as a divine person, as the Son of God, co-eternal with the Father, as the eternal choice made in him, and the everlasting covenant with him show, and who in his office capacity as mediator was set up from everlasting, and who, with respect to the virtue of his blood, Righteous and sacrifice was from the beginning of the world and was the same yesterday, today, and forever. It being by his blood that all the patriarchs from the beginning of time were pardoned, and by his righteousness they were justified, and by his grace they were saved. All which, respecting the antiquity of Christ's person, office, and grace, was known to these fathers. They knew him so as to approve of him, trust in him, and appropriate him to themselves and who obliged them to the new commandments of love, not only to God and Christ, but to one another. And the reason here given, engaging to it, is exceeding suitable to the character, it being with fathers and aged men delight in, even ancient things, to call them to remembrancy, to talk of them as things well known unto them. But nothing is more ancient than what is here, instanced in and nothing so honorable and profitable to know as this or to be glorified in and therefore the argument from hence to love those that belong to him who is the everlasting father is very strong and forcible scripture quote I write unto young men unquote who are warm and zealous for God, for his cause and interests, for the glory of a Redeemer, for his truths and ordinances, and are lively in the exercise of grace, and fevered in the discharge of duty, and are active, de- diligent, and industrious, always abounding in the work of the Lord, and are strong and robust, able to go alone, to walk by faith, being strong in it, and in the grace that is in Christ, do not need the staff that old age does, nor the hand to lead and teach to go, as children do. To these the Apostle writes the new commandment of love for this reason. Scripture, quote, Because ye have overcome the wicked one, unquote, Satan, who is eminently so, being the first that was, and the worst that is so. For he is wickedness itself, he is holy, entirely, immutably, and unutterably wicked, and his whole work and employment is in wickedness. Now, 
These young men have overcome him, not only in Christ their head, who has spoiled him, destroyed him, and led him captive in triumph, in whom they were more than conquerors, but in themselves, through the power of divine grace, holding up and making use the shield of faith against him, whereby they quenched his fierce darts and got their victory over him. This is also said in perfect agreement with the character of young men who are apt to glory in their strength and are fond of getting the advantage or a victory over others, and which is used to teach such as are so in a spiritual sense, not to glory in their strength, but in the Lord, that to love him whom they know and whose loving kindness is exercised towards them and in Christ, and to love him through whom they get the victory, and to bear the infirmities of weak, weaker saints, to whom they should be strongly affected. Scripture, quote, I read unto you little children, end quote, or babes in Christ, such as were newborn babes, just born again, not able to go alone or walk by faith, but were dangled on the knee and lay on the breast of the divine consolation and could speak, but stammeringly, not with plain, it being as much as they could do to say, Abba, Father, to these the apostle writes and urges a new commandment of love for this reason. Scripture, quote, Because ye have known the Father, end quote, the Father of Christ in him as the Father in Christ under the witness scenes of the spirit of adoption, so as, in some good measure, to hope and believe he was their father, and to love, honor, and obey him as such, to apply to him for whatever they stood in need of, and always to put themselves under his care and protection. And a consideration of this, their relation to him, and interest in him, is a strong and prevailing argument why they should not only love him, their father, and Christ, who is begotten of him, but also all the saints who are the children of their father and this, their brethren and very apt does the apostle mention this their knowledge of the father is suitable to their age and character in being one of the first and most necessary things for a child to know first john chapter 2 verse 14 this is john gill exposition of the entire bible verse by verse brought to you by discovering scriptures read by dr peter john 1 John chapter 2, verse 14, Scripture, quote, I have written unto you fathers, unquote. This, with the reason annexed to it, is repeated to raise the attention of the aged servants of Christ and to quicken them to a discharge of their duty, who are apt to obey in their zeal, to grow lukewarm and indifferent, to cleave to the world, and do to the things of it which are to cautioned against, in 1 John 2, 15, the whole of this, with the reason, Scripture, quote, because ye have known him that is from the beginning, unquote, is left out of the Vulgate Latin version and the C-O-M-P-L-U-T-E-N-S-I-A-N edition. Scripture, quote, I have written unto you, young men, unquote, this reputation to them, with some additions, is also made to stir them up the more to love saints, who are apt to be carried away with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, to warn against it. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. Scripture, quote, Because ye are strong, unquote. Not naturally, for sin has weakened, sadly, human nature, so that a man, by the strength of nature, could do nothing which is spiritually good, nor in themselves, though regenerated, but in Christ, in whom are righteousness and strength, without whom they can do nothing, though they can do all things through him, strengthening them, and so are strong in the exercise of grace on him, and the performance of every duty, being strengthened by him with the strength in their souls. Scripture, quote, And the word of God abideth in you, unquote. Either Christ the Logos, the essential word of God, who might be said to be in them and abide in them, because his grace was implanted in their hearts, called Christ, formed there, because he dealt in their hearts by faith and lived in them and hence they had their strength or came to be so strong as they were and also overcame Satan because he that was in them was greater than he that is in the world or else the gospel is meant which cometh not in word only but in power has a place in the heart 
and works effectually and dwells richly there. And this is the means of spiritual strength against sin and temptation and to perform duty and to stand fast in the truth against the errors and heresies of men and is that piece of spiritual armor, the sword of the Spirit, by which Satan is often foiled and overcome, hence it follows. Scripture quote, And ye have overcome the wicked one. Unquote. See Gill on 1 John chapter 2, verse 13. John Gill, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Scripture quote, Love not the world. Unquote. The habitable earth, the world in which men live, this is not to be loved by saints, as if it were their habitation, where they are always to be, and so loath to remove from it, seeing they are but sojourners and pilgrims, and strangers here. This is not their rest, nor dwelling place, their continuing city, or proper country. This is heaven. Nor should they love the men of the world who are, as they came into it, are of it, and the mind the things of it, and lie in wickedness, and are wicked men. For though these are to be loved as men, as fellow creatures, and their good, both spiritual and temporal, is to be sought, and good is to be done to them, as much as lies in our power, both with respect to soul and body, yet their company is not to be chosen and preferred to the saints, but to be shunned and avoided as disagreeable and dangerous. Their evil conversation and wicked communications are not to be loved, but abhorred, and their works of darkness are to be reproved. Nor are there ways to be intimidated and their customs followed, nor their manners to be conformed unto. Scripture, quote, Neither are the things that are in the world, unquote. Good men that are in the world, though they are not of the world, are to be loved in the kingdom of Christ. Though it is not the world, yet it is in the world and is to be regarded and promoted to the utmost. And there are the natural and civil things in the world called this world's good, which may be loved within due bounds and used in a proper manner, though they are not to be loved inordinately and abused. This is the character of worldly men. So the Jews call such, such that love worlds. Neither relations and friends in the world and the blessings of life may be loved and enjoyed in their way, but not above God and Christ, or so as to take up satisfaction and contentment in them, to make idols of them and put trust and confidence in them and prefer them to spiritual and heavenly things and be so taken with them as to be con- concerned for and careless about the other but the evil things in the world or at least the evil use of them and affection for them are here intended as appeared from the following verse. Now, it is chiefly with respect to the fathers and young men that this exhortation is given and the repetition of what is said to them before is made to introduce this which is exceeding suitable to their age and characters. Old men are apt to be covetous and love the world and the worldly things just when they are going out of it and about to leave them and the young men are apt to be carried away with lust, vanity, ambition, and pride and therefore from each of these the apostle dissuades from the following arguments. Scripture, quote, If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Unquote. That is, the love of God, as the Alexandrian copy and the Ethiopic version read, who is the Father of Christ and all the elect in him, and who is indeed by creation the Father of all men, the Father of spirits, of the souls of men, and of angels, and the Father of mercies and of lights, and by the love of him is meant... Either the love with which he loves his people and which being shed abroad in their hearts attracts the soul of himself and causes it to love him above the world and all things in it and such and one esteems of it and an interest in it more than life and all the enjoyments of it and is by it loosened to the world and sets light by it and can part with all good things in it and suffer all evil things cheerfully under the constraints and influences of this love so that it is a clear case that when the affections of men are set upon the world and they are glued to the things of it, their hearts are not warmed with a sense of the love of God or this is not sensibly in them or shed abroad in their hearts. Or else by the love of God is meant love of God, which is inconsistent with the love of the world or with such an inordinate love of mammon as to serve it. For a man may as soon 
serve two masters that serve God and man, which he can never do truly, faithfully, and affectionately, and which also is not consistent with friendship with the men of the world or a conversation fellowship with them in things that are evil, whether superstitious or profaneness. See Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. John Gill, 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. Scripture, quote, For all this is in the world, unquote. This is the sum of evil things in the world, or these following are the objects of sin in the world, or about which wicked men are conversant, even such as are carnal or grateful in the flesh, visible to the eye, and belong to this vain life, or serve to fill with pride and vanity. All these are the main things which men that love the world most highly value and esteem. Scripture quote, and lust of the flesh, unquote, by which is meant, not lust in general or concupiscence, the corruptness of nature, which is the foundation of all sin, or enjoying sin, the flesh, or that corrupt pride, which lust against the spirit, nor the various lusts of the flesh, fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, and which are many, and are also called worldly lusts, but some particular one, a lust, of the body as a Syriac version reads either the lust of uncleanness which includes all unchastised desires thoughts words and actions fornications adultery rape incest sodomy and all unnatural lust and which make up a considerable part of all that is in the world or else intemperancy in eating and drinking gluttony and drunkenness excessive wine surfeiting rioting and reveling and all the sensual pleasures of life by which the carnal mind and the lust of it are gratified, whereby the soul is destroyed, the body is dishonored, and the womb, dishonor, and reproach brought on the character not to be removed, for which reasons the world and the things of it are not to be loved. The next follows. Scripture quote, The lust of the eyes, unquote. After lawful objects and may design unchaste and lascivious looks, eyes full of adultery, and whereby adultery is committed, see Matthew 5.28. But then this falls in which the other, unless that be confined to intemperancy, rather than this may intend a sinful curiosity of seeing vain sights and shows, with which the eye of man is never satisfied, Ecclesiastes 1.8. And against which the Psalms prays, Psalms 119, verse 37. Or rather, the sin of covetousness is here designed, the object of which is visible things, as gold, silver, houses, lands, and possessions, with which riches the eyes of men are never satisfied, and which sin is drawn forth and cherished by the eyes. And indeed, a covetous man has little more satisfaction than the beholding his substance with his eyes, and in which he takes much spiritual sinful pleasure see ecclesiastical 4 8 and what a poor vain empty thing is this therefore it loved not the world hence this is a principal thing in it as is also scripture quote the pride of life unquote by which seems to be meant ambition of honor of chief places and high titles as in the scribes and the pharisees matthew 23 verse 6 or of great grand living for the world signifies not so much life as living living in a sumptuousness, gay, luxurious, and pompous manner, in rich diet, costly apparel, having the fine seats, palaces, and stately buildings, numerous attendances, all which is vanity and vexation of spirit. See Ecclesiastical 2.1. The Syriac and Arabic version read, The pride of the age, and every age has some particular thing in which the pride of it appears. Now, neither of Scripture, quote, is of the Father, unquote. Of God the Father, as the Ethiopic version reads, the things which are desired and lusted after are of God, but not the lust itself. God is not the author of sin, nor is it agreeable to his will. Scripture, quote, but is of the world, unquote, of the men of it, and agreeable to the carnal minds, and is the reason why things of the world are not to be loved by the saints, who are not of it, but chosen and called out of it, and besides, all these things are mean, base, vile, and corruptible, and unworthy of their love and affection. John Gill, 1 John chapter 2, verse 17, Scripture, quote, And the world passes away, unquote. Not the matter and substance, but the fashion, form, and scheme of it. 
1 Corinthians 7.31 Kingdoms, cities, towns, houses, families, estates, and possessions are continually changing and casting into different hands and different forms. And then the world, the inhabitants of it, are continually removing. One generation goes and another comes. New faces are continually appearing. The riches and honors of the world are fading, perishing, and transitory things. Everything is upon a flux. Nothing is permanent. Nothing. Which is another argument why the world and the things of it are not to be loved. Scripture, quote, in the lust thereof, unquote, also passes away and the objects of lust are fading and fleeting as beauty and riches and honors. These are continually taken away from men or men are taken away from them and will not be hereafter. Even the pleasure of lust itself passes away as soon as enjoyed. The pleasures of sin are but for a season and a very short one and are intended but imaginary and leave a real bitterness and sorrow behind them and at length brings a man to ruin and destruction. Scripture quote, But he that doeth the will of God, unquote, not perfectly as contained in the law, which is good and perfect and agreeable will of God, for no man can do that in such a manner, though a regenerate man desires to do it, even as it is done in heaven, and serves the law of God with his mind and under the influence of the Spirit of God, and does walk in his statutes and keeps his judgment with the principle of love, in faith and without mercenary views and sinister ends, without depending on what he does for life and salvation, and such a one may be said to be a doer of the will of God, though rather here it intends such a one as believes in Christ as the propitiation for his sins and as his advocate with the Father and who makes Christ his pattern and example and walks as he walks and particularly observes the new commandment of love, loves God and Christ and his fellow Christians and not the world and the things of it and such a man is happy for he, scripture quote, Abideth forever, unquote, in the love of God, which will never depart from him, nor shall he be separated from that, and in the hands and arms of Christ, out of which none can pluck him, and in the family and household of God, where he as a son abides forever, and shall never be cast out, and in a state of justification, and shall never enter into condemnation, and in a state of grace and holiness, from whence he shall never fall totally and finally, and in heaven with Christ to all eternity. The reason of this is abiding is not his doing the will of God, which is only descriptive of him manifestly, and not the cause of his perpetual and immovable but his eternal election of God, which stands sure, not on the foot of works, but of him that calleth in the covenant of grace, in which he is interested, and which is immovable, sure, firm, and inviolable, and the foundation, Jesus Christ, on which he is built, the principle of grace in him, which always remains and is connected with eternal life. John Gill, 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. Quote, Scripture, quote, Little children, it is the last time, unquote, or hour, not of the Jewish civil and church state, for that had been at an end for some time. The epistle was written some years after the destruction of Jerusalem, nor the last hour of the gospel dispensation or world to come. For this was but for the first age of that, and much less the last hour of time, or of the present world itself. For that has been many hundreds of years since, but the last hour of the apostolic age. All the apostles were now dead. John was the last of them. Perilous times were now coming on. Impostors and heretics were rising apace against which the apostle causes his little children. And so still he writes to them, agreeably to their, their age and character, who being such were most likely to be imposed upon by those who lie in wait to deceive. Scripture quote, And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, unquote, or is coming, and begins to show himself in the false teachers and deceivers, who were his forthrunners, and this they had heard and understood, either from the words of Christ in John chapter 5, verse 43, or from the account of Apostle Paul gave to the Thessalonians concerning him, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3, or rather it may be that what the Apostle had said to the elders of the church at Ephesus, where the Apostle John now was when he met them at Miletus, that's M-I-L-E-T-U-S, Acts chapter 20, verse 29. Scripture, quote, Even now there are many antichrists, unquote. The Syriac and Ethiopic version read, False Christ. But such are not intended here, 
that set up for the Messiahs, whom Christ foretold should arise before the destruction of Jerusalem. Matthew chapter 24, verse 24. For that was now over, and those false Christ had arisen and were gone. In this sense, it could be admitted. Bar Kolkabab, at C-O-C-A-B, in Andrian's time, bids fair to be the false Christ to Messiah in the preceding clause. In the same versions, they're read, but such as were adversaries of Christ, as the Arabic version renders it, are meant who set themselves against Christ and were opposers of his person, incarnation, and office, who either deny that he was the Christ or that he was come in the flesh, the truth of his incarnation or his proper deity or real humanity, such as Evelyn, Serratus, that's C-E-R-I-N-T-H-U-S, and others. The apostle might well say there were many since in his time were the followers of Simon Magnus, the Mendrians, the Saturans, and numerous others reckoned by. And hence we learn that the Antichrist is not one single individual, but many. Antichrist in the former clause is explained by Antichrist in this. See First John 2, verse 22. And though the popes of Rome are, by way of eminency, the Antichrist that should come, and which those deceivers were the forerunners of and paved the way for. Yet they are not the only Antichrist. There were others before them, and there are many now besides them. Scripture, quote, Whereby we know that this is the last time, unquote. The pure apostolic age was now going off with the doctrines, the disciplines, and worship of which are were easy to be discerned by the multitude of antichrists which now appeared, and it may well be thought to be the last time or near the end of the things with us, since almost every heresy is revived among us. John Gill, 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. Scripture, quote, They went out from us, unquote, which intends not the persons that went down from Judah to Antioch, Acts chapter 15, verse 1, who preached destructive doctrines to the Gentiles, which the apostles and the church of Judah disowned and censured, by which it appeared that all the preachers of these doctrines were not of them, and of the same mind with them, for this sense makes this these antichrists to be the only preachers, whereas, though many of them might be such, yet not all, for whoever in a private capacity denied the Father and the Son, or that Christ was come in the flesh, was Antichrist. And to these private believers are opposed in First John chapter 2 verse 20, and it also makes the us to be the apostles whereas they were all dead but John. And these Antichrists were men that had risen up then in the last time and therefore could not with propriety be said to go out from the apostles. Besides, whenever the apostle uses this pronoun us, he includes with himself all true believers and may more especially here intend the churches of Asia or rather the members of the church at Ephesus where he was. Nor is it likely he should have in view the church of Judah and in a case in which that was concerned near 40 years ago, moreover, such a sense making the going out to be merely local and corporal and which is in itself not criminal. The persons that went from Judah to Antioch are not blamable for going thither, nor for going out from the apostles thither, but for troubling the disciples with words or to the subverting of their souls, nor was a corporal departure from the apostles any evidence of not being of the same mind with them. For they often departed one from another, yet continued with the same mind and in the same faith, but the sense is that there were some persons in the apostle John's time who had made a profession of religion, were members of the church, and some of them perhaps preachers, and yet they departed from the faith and dropped the profession of it and withdrew themselves from the church or churches to which they belonged and set up separate assemblies of their own. Scripture, quote, But they were not of us, unquote. They were of the church and of the same mind with it, at least in profession, uh, antecedents to their going out, or had they not been in communion with the church, 
they could not be properly said to go out of it. And if they had not been of the same mind and faith and profession, they could not be said to depart from it. For they were not truly regenerated by the grace of God, and so apparently were not of the number of Christ's elect, notwithstanding their profession and communion with the church. They were of the world and not of God. They were not true believers. They had not that anointing which abides, and from which persons are purely denominated Christians or anointed ones. Scripture, quote, For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, unquote. In the doctrine of the apostles and the fellowship of the church, as true believers do, and their hearts had been right with God, they would have remained steadfast to him, his gospel, truths, and ordinances, and faithful with his saints, for such who are truly regenerate are born of incorruptible seed, and those they have received the anointing which makes them truly Christians, that abides as does every true grace, faith, hope, and love, and such who are truly God's elect cannot possibly fall into such errors and heresies as these did, and be finally deceived as they were. Scripture quote, But they went out, unquote. They went out from us, so the Syriac version reads, Scripture quote, so that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us, unquote. The word all is left out in the Syriac version. The defection and apostasies of these persons were permitted by God that it might appear that they had never received the grace of God in truth, and their going out was in such a manner that it was a certain argument that they did not and were not of the elect, since they became antichrist deny the deity or sonship of Christ, and that he was come in the flesh, or that he was the Christ, and, and therefore are said to be of the world and not of God, First John chapter 2 to verse 22, so that this passage furnishes out no argument against the saints' perseverancy, which is confirmed in First John chapter 2 verse 20. John Gill, First John chapter 2 verse 20, brought to you by Discovering the Scriptures, being read by Dr. Peter John. First John chapter 2, verse 20, Scripture, quote, But ye have an unction from the Holy One, unquote, meaning the Spirit and His graces, with which Christ the Head is anointed without measure, and His members in the measure, from whence He is called Christ and they Christians. These were really the Lord's anointed ones. They were true believers, were the wise virgins who had oil in their vessels with their lamps, which would never go out. The grace of the Spirit is called a chrism or an ointment or an anointing in allusion to the anointing oil under the law. See Matthew 5, 3 from Gil. On which anointing oil the Jews say that it continues all of it to time to come, an example, to the times of the Messiah, as it is said in Exodus 30, verse 31. Now that the saints had from the Holy One, or that Holy One meaning, not the Holy Spirit of God, though it is true that this anointing or these graces were from Him, He is the author of them, and may truly be said to anoint with them, nor the Father, who is holy in His nature and in His works, and is the God of all grace, and is said to anoint saints too. Second Corinthians one twenty one. But rather the Lord Jesus Christ who is holy, both as God and man, and from whose fullness all grace is had. This oil, or ointment, was first poured on him without measure, and from him it descends to all the members of his mystical body, as the ointment poured on Aaron's head descended to his beard and to the skirts of his garments. See 1 John chapter 2, verse 27. Scripture, quote, and ye know all things, unquote. For this anointing is a teaching one. It makes persons of quick understanding, and enlightens their understandings, refreshes their memories, and strengthens all the powers and faculties of the soul, and leads into the knowledge of all spiritual things, and into all the mysteries of grace and truths of the gospel, into all things necessary for salvation. For these words are not to be taken in the largest sense in which they are only applicable to the omniscience God, but to be restrained to the subject matter treated of, and to those things chiefly in which the Antichrist and deceiver is cited, and are regarded not a perfect knowledge, for those that know most of these things 
under the influence of this unction, no, in, but in part. The Seric version reads, All men. And so refers to this discerning of spirits, of the spirit of truth, from the spirit of error, a gift which was bestowed on many in the primitive times in which they could distinguish hypocrisy from true believers and antichrists and deceivers and hypocrites from the faithful ministers of the word. One of Stephen's copies reads, And ye all know. John Gill, 1 John chapter 2, verse 21. Scripture, quote, I have not written unto you, unquote. Either this epistle, or rather what particularly here, regards those apostates from the truth, in order to shun them and not be deceived by them. The apostle here outlays an objection that he saw might be made upon what he last said, that they knew all things, and, if so, why then did he write the things he did, since they knew them before? To which he answers that he did not write them as to ignorant, but to knowing persons. Scripture, quote, Because ye know not the truth, because ye know it. Unquote. The Father who is the God of truth, Christ who is truth itself, and the Spirit, who is the Spirit of truth, and the Gospel, which is the Word of truth, and the Scriptures, which are the Scriptures of truth, and from whence truth is to be fetched, and by them to be confirmed and defended, and which, if they had not known, it would have been to no purpose for him to have written to them about the Antichrist that were come into the world, and though they did know the truth, it was very proper to put them in remembrance of it and to establish them in it against the deceivers which supposes former knowledge of it. Scripture, and that no lie is of the truth, unquote. either springs from it or is according to it, but just the reverse. The apostle has respect to the errors and heresies of the above apostates, which were fragrant contradictions to the gospel and as distant from it as a lie is to the truth. And of such lies, and of those liars, he speaks in the next verses. The Arabic version reads, And that every liar is not of the truth. John Gill, 1 John chapter 2, verse 22. Scripture, quote, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is Christ, unquote. Or that very Christ and true Messiah, who was spoken of by all the prophets since the beginning of the world, and so much and so long desired by the Old Testament saints, that he denies that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah of the prophets, is not indeed the only liar in the world, but he is the greatest of liars, that is a consumption lie, being opposed to a glaring truth, to a fact clear and indisputable, and which rests not merely on the testimony of Jesus, who is truth itself, and who in expressed words more than once declared and asserted himself to be the Christ, but all the characters of the Messiah, everything that is said of him in the prophets, meet in Jesus, and the miracles which were done by him are flagrant proofs and undeniable evidences of his being the Christ of God, and all the apostles believed and were sure that he was Christ, the Son of the living God, to which may be added the testimony of John, who was sent and came to bear witness of him, and did, and who was a prophet and a man of great uh, probity and integrity. But there was a greater witness than he, even God himself, by a voice from heaven, bore testimony to him, and angels at his incarnation declared him to be the Savior, which is Christ the Lord, yea, the devil himself, who is the liar and the father of, t of lies, and other things new and own Jesus to be Christ. So that those who deny him are the worst of liars, even worse than the devil himself. This may have regard not only to the Jews, but deny Jesus to be the Messiah, but chiefly to such who went by the name of Christians, who deny either the, his proper deity or real humanity as Ebon and C-E-R-I-N-T-H-U-S.
who was denying him to be the God-man, the mediator, and Messiah, and is true of all such that deny him and any of his officers or in any things relating to them as his gospel and any of the peculiar doctrines of it delivered by him and so deny his prophetic office or any of his ordinances, institutions, and appointments as lawgiver in his house and the king of saints and so deny him in his kingly office or reject him as the alone savior joining their own works with him in the business of salvation opposed his sacrifice and satisfaction despise his imputed righteousness and so deny him in his priestly office now these are some of the liars, and these some of the doctrinal lies, which are not of the truth, as in first John chapter two verse twenty one. Scripture, quote, He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son, unquote, that denies the Father of Christ to be the creator of the world, but asserts that it was made by angels, as some ancient heretics did, or that the Father of Christ is not the God of the Old Testament, as Marcon, or that deny that God is the Father of Christ, and that Christ is the Son of God, who will not allow that there is any such relation in nature, between between them who affirms that Christ is only the Son of God by adoption or because of his love to him or because of his incarnation and resurrection from the dead or that he is not his true and proper Son only in a figurative and metamorphical sense that he is not the natural and eternal begotten Son of God only by office and as mediator in that God is only his Father as having installed him into his office, or he that denies that these two are distinct from each other, but affirms that Father is the Son, and the Son is the Father, and so confounds them both, and by confusing both, denies that there is either Father or Son, or all such persons are Antichrist, or opposers of Christ. John Gill, First John chapter 2, verse 23. Scripture, quote, Whosoever denieth the Son, unquote. Jesus Christ is the true, proper, natural, essential, and eternal Son of God. Scripture, quote, The same hath not the Father, unquote, or does not hold the Father, or believe the Father, as the Civic Version renders it. For there cannot be a Father without a Son, and he that honors not the Son, by owning him as such, honors not the Father. Whatever reflects dishonor of the Son, reflects dishonor on the Father. If Christ is not truly and properly the Son of God, the Father is not truly and properly the Father of Christ. If Christ is only a Son in a figurative and metamorphical sense, the Father is only a Father in a figurative and metamorphical sense. If Christ is a Son only by office, then the Father is a Father only by office, which is monstrously stupid. Such a one does not hold the true doctrine of the Father, and does not appear to have true faith in Him, true love unto Him, or real interest in Him only by profession. Scripture, quote, But he that acknowledges the Son hath the Father also, unquote. This clause is left out in many copies and stands by a supplement in our version, but it is in the Alexandrian copy in four of the Bezos manuscripts and in some others, and in the Vulgate Latin, Syriac, and Ethiopic versions, and confirms and illustrates what is said before. For as he that denies the sonship of Christ cannot hold the parenthesis of God, for he that owns the sonship of Christ, the second person, maintains the paternity of the first, for these two are correlated and mutually put, or take away each other, no mention is made of the Spirit, because as yet no controversy had arisen concerning him. John Gill, First John chapter 2, verse 24, Scripture quote, let that therefore abide in you, unquote, meaning the word of God, First John chapter 2, verse 14, the gospel of Christ, which there was reason to believe had a place in their hearts, and which they had embraced and professed. And therefore the apostle exhorts them to perseverance in it, and particularly not to let go the doctrine concerning the Father and the Son, and this their relation to each other which is the foundational of the doctrine of the Trinity and of the distinct personality of Father, Son, and Spirit, the contrary to which leads to three without either name or distinction from each other. The arguments to enforce this exhortation follow. Scripture, quote, Which ye have heard from the beginning, unquote. They had heard it not externally only, but internally. They had hearkened to it, and from the heart obeyed it. They had mixed it with faith and received the love of it. They had heard it from the apostles of Christ, who were 
eye and ear witnesses of the word, and this they had heard at the first preaching of the gospel to them, at the first of their con conversion. The apostles of Christ began the ministry with the sonship of Christ, and greatly insisted on it, in it, and required a profession of it before baptism, and which was made in order to it, and these believers had been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son, as standing in such a relation to each other. See Acts chapter 9 verse 20. And therefore ought not to relinquish this truth, and receive a new and upstart notion, and for further encouragement to continue in it. It is added. Scripture quote. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye shall also continue in the Son and in the Father. Unquote. As those that are once and either always will, what is here said is not either the cause or condition of men being in the Father and in the Son, or of their continuance in them, but it is descriptive of the persons that are in them, and is an open and manifest evidence of their being continuance in them, such are in union with Christ and at times enjoy sensible communion with them, and shall never be finally and totally removed from it. They are in the love of Christ, from whence there is no separations, and in the arms and hands of Christ, out of which none can pluck them, and they abide by him in the exercise of faith and love, and cleave unto him with a full purpose of heart, and will hold on and out professing his name to the end, and they are and abide in the love of God the Father, which is from everlasting to everlasting, in the covenant of his grace, which is sure and inviolable, and in participation of the blessing and promise of it, among which the following one, eternal life, is a principal one. John Gill, the exposition of the entire Bible, verse by verse, brought to you by Discovering the Scriptures, read by Dr. Peter John. John Gill, First John chapter 2, verse 25, Scripture, quote, and this is the promise that he hath promised us. Unquote. Commentary. Either God the Father, who is that God that cannot lie, who is the covenant of his grace, before the world began, made this promise unto his people. Scripture. Quote, Even eternal life. Unquote. Exposition. Which promise, with all others, was put into the hands of Christ, where with them it is yea, and amen. And also the thing itself promised, where it is hid, and lies safe and secure, or the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has promised it in the Gospel. For this is in the sum of the Gospel declaration, that whoever believes in him shall have everlasting life, and this lies in the knowledge of the Father and of the Son, and in the enjoyment of them, and conformity to them. Wherefore the doctrine respecting them ought to be retained and firmly adhered to. John Gill, 1 John chapter 2, verse 26. Scripture, quote, These things have I written unto you, unquote. John Gill's Exposition The little children who were most likely to be imposed upon by Antichrist and deceivers. Scripture, quote, Concerning them that seduce you, unquote. Exposition The Syriac, Arabic, and Ethiopic version render it for them that seduce you. Not that they were actually seduced and carried away with the errors of the wicked, for though God's elect may be staggered and wavered and be tossed to and fro by false teachers and their doctrines, yet they cannot be totally and finally deceived. But the sense is, these men endeavored to seduce them. They lay in wait to deceive and attempt to deceive them by walking in craftiness and handling the word of God deceitfully, and therefore that they might be known and so shunned and avoided. The Apostle points them out and shows who they are, that they are such who deny that Jesus is the Christ, and do not own neither the Father nor the Son, and in doing which he acted the part of a tender father, a faithful shepherd, and careful monitor. John Gill, 1 John chapter 2, verse 27, quoting the scriptures, quote, But the anointing which ye have received of him, unquote. John Gill's Exposition The Spirit and the Grace of the Spirit, which they have received out of the fullness of grace, which is in Christ, and is compared to oil or ointment. See Gill on 1 John 2.20 For Christ, the anointed, is the foundation of it all, and it is had from him in a way of giving and receiving. So the second seraphim, or number in the 
Jews, Kabbalistic tree, which is wisdom, has for one of its surnames the fountain of the oil of unction. This, quoting scripture, abideth in you, unquote. Exposition. The Syriac and Arabic version renders it, if it abideth, which spoils the text, for the words are not conditional, but affirmative. Grace is an internal thing. It is oil in the vessel of the heart, and where it, it once is, it abides, as does every grace of spirit, as faith, hope, love, and every other grace will never be taken away. God will not take it away, for where he has once bestowed it, the men and devils cannot, it cannot, never be lost as it, to its principle and being of it it is an incorruptible seed and a living principle which can never be destroyed notwithstanding all the corruptions in the human heart the pollution of the world and the temptations of satan quoting scripture quote, and ye need not that any man teach you unquote. john gill's exposition not that they were perfect in knowledge for no man is absolutely only comparatively so in this life, or that they needed not, or were above and exempt from the instructions of Christ's faithful servants, for John himself taught them, and to teach and instruct them was the end of his writing this epistle to them, but the sense is either that they needed not the teaching of these men before mentioned, the Antichrist, liars, and seducers, being better taught and having an unction by which they knew all things, or they needed not to be taught as if they were babes in Christ as unskillful in the word of righteousness but so as to increase in spiritual knowledge and go on to perfection and be established in the present truths at least so as to be put in remembrance of them or rather they needed not nor were they to regard any mere human revelation and doctrine for the whole gospel was come by Jesus Christ and no other is to be expected to receive by men nor any doctrine, but what is according to the revelation of Christ, wherefore saints under the gospel dispensations are taught of God by his Spirit according to the word of truth and by the ministry of it, and have no need of learning every man from his neighbor or from his brother in any special revelation, so that the passage does not mitigate against the eternal ministry of the gospel or human teachings according to that perfect rule and declaration of the whole mind and will of God by Christ under the gospel dispensation. Quoting scripture, quote, But as the same anointing, unquote, exposition, the Vulgate Latin and Arabic version reads, His anointing, that is, God through Christ. And so the Syriac version renders it, the unction which is of God, meaning the same as before. The Ethiopic version renders it his spirit, which, though not a true version, is no improper or impertinent sense of the phrase. And this scripture, quote, teacheth you of all things, unquote. John Gill's exposition, quote, truths and doctrines necessary to salvation, as in 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, unquote. Scripture, quote, and it is truth, and it is no lie. Quote, John Gill's exposition, or true and not a liar, which is just character of the spirit of truth, in opposition to the spirit of error, and holds good to the grace of the spirit, which is truth in the inward parts, and is genuine and sincere. Scripture, quote, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him, unquote. In Christ, from whom they received this anointing, see Gil and First John chapter two verse twenty four, or in the anointing itself and the grace of the Spirit in which they stood. Some versions read in the imperative abiding him, or it as in First John chapter two, verse twenty eight. John Gill, First John chapter two, verse twenty eight. Scripture quote, and now little children abide in him. Unquote. The Apostle, having finished his separate instructions, exhortations to the fathers, young men and children, returns to the whole body of the saints in general, whom he addresses, as in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, under the name of little children. See Gil on 1 John 2, verse 1. 
in whom he exhorts to abide in Christ, that is, in the exercise of faith on him, of hope in him, and love to him, and to hold to him, the head, and to hold fast his word and gospel, and abide by the truth and ordinances, and adhere to his cause and interest, and not be moved away by any consideration to which the following encouragement is given. Scripture, quote, But when he shall appear, unquote, that is, Christ, who is now hid out of the sight of by the eyes, is in heaven at the right hand of God, but ere long he will appear a second time, and not only to those that look for him, but even every eye shall see him, and his appearance he will be a glorious one, and his saints shall appear in glory with him, and shall be like him, and shall see him as he is. Scripture, quote, We may have confidence, unquote, boldness and freedom, as now at the throne of grace, so then at the throne of judgment, where the saints will stand with courage and intrepidity, when the wicked will flee to the rocks and mountains, being filled with amazement, terror, and trembling. Scripture, quote, and not be ashamed before him at his coming, unquote. They will not be put to shame by him, nor will they be ashamed of their confidence, faith, hope, and expectation. Their hope will not make them ashamed, for they will not enjoy what they have hoped for, and notwithstanding all their sins and infirmities, they will not be ashamed, for they will have on the wedding garment the in righteousness of Christ, and will stand before the throne without fault, spot, or blemish. Nor will Christ be ashamed of them who have not been ashamed of him and his words, but have confessed him, and have been faithful unto death, and have cleaved to him and his cause, with full purpose of heart to the end. Some think ministers of the gospel are here meant, who, when those that are under their care abide faithfully and persevere to the end, will give up their accounts with joy and will have what they have expressed confidence in and will have their expectations answered and not disappointed by having such souls as their joy and crown of rejoicing. John Gill's Exposition of the Entire Bible brought to you by Discovering the Scriptures being read by Dr. Peter John Parisi. 1 John chapter 2, verse 29. The last verse of this chapter, scripture being read, quote, If ye know that he is righteous, unquote. John Gill's exposition being read now, quote, That is, Christ who is righteous as God in his nature and in his works and as man in his obediency, life, and conversation, and as mediator in faithfully discharging the work he undertook, and is the author of an everlasting righteousness which is imputed by God, revealed in the gospel and received by faith, all which they knew, for this is not said as doubting, but rather as taking it for granted that they did know it, if, or seeing ye know, etc., then it follows. Reading the scriptures, quote, ye know, unquote, reading John Gill, or know ye, ye may assure yourselves. Reading scripture, quote, that everyone that doeth righteousness, unquote, Reading John Gill, not merely works of righteousness, especially in order to justify him before God, for such a one is so far from being born of God or born again that he, manifestly in a state of nature in opposition to an enmity against God, is not subject to him. He does not submit to the righteousness of God, but goes about to establish his own and betrays his ignorancy and want of grace. But in intent such a one who with the heart believes unto righteousness and lays hold by faith and lives unto the righteousness of Christ for justification, and who performs good works in faith and from a principle of love, not to obtain a justifying righteousness, but because he is justified by the righteousness of Christ, and such a one, Scripture, quote, is born of him, unquote, John Gill, either of God or rather of Christ, being regenerated by his Spirit, having his grace imprinted in him as appears by his faith, in his righteousness and by his works of righteousness, as fruit of faith, and having his image stamped on him, and he himself formed in him, and so made like unto him, by all which is evident he is one of his spiritual seed and offspring. The Syriac Virgin reads, is of him, belongs to him, is one of his, and this makes way for what is said of adoption of the following chapter, and should begin here. 
This ends 1 John chapter 2, verse 29, and chapter 2 of John Gill's brought to you by Discovering the Scriptures, being read by Dr. Peter John.